DJ, you're Schwab's uh, voice for ETFs. I know you travel around a lot to Schwab offices around the country. What are you and Schwab telling investors nervous about the recession? What are you telling them investors are nervous about banks? What are you telling investors to do right now? So uh, keep your eye on the long term, right? Uh, human behavior uh, often leads us all to overreact to short-term market moves or turmoil or things we're reading about. But if you, you know, most investors really have longer time horizons, five years, 10 years, 20 years, if you're uh, working towards your retirement. So find a trusted advisor, get a strategic asset allocation portfolio assembled, and, and ETFs can do a lot to keep you diversified. And our front, first quarter flows are really a reminder of all the different parts of uh, the investment portfolio ETFs can touch. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I mentioned, uh, DJ, the big flows at the top. They are a little all over the place. We saw outflows from U.S. equity, uh, inflows into equity international, uh, inflows into treasuries, outflows from corporate and from high yield generally. So it's, investors have been all over the map this quarter. Can, can you make sense of this? Sometimes I don't pay attention to inflows because I don't think they say much, but this one is so all over the place. It, it bears some commentary here, and there's the numbers here we're putting up. Right, and the key is overall flows, you know, we, and we might end the first quarter with around 80 billion in ETF inflows, right? So still the, 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 the tool of ETFs are still resonating with investors and advisors and really are still the investor, investment vehicle of choice. And then if you, if you peel back the onion and you look at some of the subsector moves, you know, like we, we talked about earlier, U.S. equities, we had a pretty rough 2022. And so human psychology, human behavior sometimes is to, is to you know, move away from something that hasn't been working well and look for something that has. And fixed income, now you've got yield. Uh, international equities uh, outperformed a little bit last year, have certainly outperformed in the first quarter. Uh, by the way, kind of a welcome move. I think most U.S. investors are under allocated towards international equities. And so uh, rebalancing there to get some more exposure could make sense for a lot of investors. So, uh, you know, what we're seeing is still reassuring that ETFs are a choice for asset allocation. Um, uh, just picking up on the equity flows there, Nate, um, U.S. equity flows, modest outflows, but even modest is a, a bit unusual. Um, pick up on what DJ was talking about there. Is this a, a delayed effect from last year's poor performance uh, or is it liquidity? Remember, the Federal Reserve has been raising rates and, you know, quantitative tightening is going on and there's theoretically less money moving into the asset management space. Um, uh, and remember, uh, I, we talked, you and I, about this last week. Some investors are parking huge amounts of cash in money market funds toward the end of March. That's got to be telling us something. It makes sense of this for us. Yeah, so equity ETF flows are particularly interesting to me this year because you look at the S&P 500, it's up about 4% year to date, but it appears that investors have decided to take a much more cautious approach to the markets right now. Um, I think that's a combination of investor concerns regarding the Fed potentially staying too aggressive for too long and perhaps the economy experiencing a, a harder landing. Certainly the recent banking crisis is playing a role here. This just isn't an environment where investors are looking to add risk assets right now. And that's reflected in uh, ETF flows. Now, on the international ETF side, there's certainly more investor interest there. I think that's really a combination of three things. I think there is a little bit of performance chasing going on here because broad international stocks have fairly significantly outperform U.S. stocks since about the beginning of the fourth quarter of last year. And if you'll recall, it's been tough sledding for international stocks for the better part of a, a decade plus. And so I think investors uh, are looking at that performance and, and perhaps reallocating there. I also think there is a subset of investors betting on a Fed pivot at some point, which that could pressure the U.S. dollar. A weaker dollar does tend to be a tailwind for international stocks. And then some investors view valuations as much more attractive overseas. So I think it's a combination of, of those three things. And then I'll, I'll just point out one real bright spot for ETFs this past quarter, which you were alluding to, has been on the fixed income side of the equation. About $40 billion has gone into U.S. Treasury ETFs alone this year. And if you look at that, it's really across the curve. But specifically, if you look at shorter term U.S. Treasury ETFs, nearly $20 billion has gone into those. And 
I think the mentality there is very simple, which is given the uncertainty around the Fed and the economy, yeah. and then you toss in a, a regional banking crisis, I think investors are content to hide out in treasuries, scoop up four or five percent yield and uh, wait yeah. until things look a little better. But 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 Nate, the, the even even with uh, the big inflows into Treasury ETFs, overall flows this year are, are, are positive, but they're a lot smaller than they've been in recent years. I, I have 70 billion. This is your number uh, in inflows so far. I mean, this time last year, we had 200 billion dollars. We had three times as much uh, in, in inflows here. So uh, even with these huge inflows into Treasuries and international, it, this is a, a subpar quarter. I'm just I'm just curious about this. We haven't seen this in a while, you know. Yeah, and I think that, again, just speaks to the apprehension on the part of investors. They're not willing to take risk right now. And I'll give you a good example of this. If you look at an ETF, say, like the uh, Technology Select Sector Spider ETF, XLK, or you look at the uh, ARK Innovation ETF, ticker ARKK, to me, those offer a real window into investor psyche right now because both of those are up around 20% this year. XLK has $2 billion in outflows. Uh, ARKK has slight outflows, about $100 million. That's a clear indication of overall investor sentiment right now. Investors simply aren't uh, buying this up move, particularly when you start peeling back the layers and you, you look at a sector like uh, tech. Yeah. Uh, DJ, I want to go back to the bond fund things because it, it, this split in, in flows for bond funds is really quite startling. So you, you've got a number of uh, these. So your short-term Treasury ETF had inflows, big inflows. I think it was $3 billion. And everybody else's short-term Treasury funds had big inflows. But elsewhere, we had outflows from, generally outflows from corporate bond uh, funds and high-yield funds. So this was sort of one of the more jarring months for, for bond ETFs. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and what Nate was just saying makes perfect sense. And we can apply the same logic to the fixed income market. So it's overall a little uh, aversion to risk, right? So high yield bond funds, outflows, even investment grade corporate bonds, a little bit of outflows and, and, and the corollary inflows into treasuries, right? So it's a it's a. Uh, seeking safety uh, move, which is not, not surprising. And then the yields uh, of front-end treasuries are pretty compelling. Right? There was a point in time in the first quarter where you could get almost 5% yields for front-end treasuries. Now with the rally that's come down, it's closer to four and a quarter, four and three-eighths. But that's still pretty, that's a, that's a fair amount of income for a front-end treasury uh, ETF. And even in the equity flows, if we look, um, as, as Nate was saying, you know, the, the valuations in international might be a little bit more reassuring. And if you look at where the flows did flow in the first quarter into equity ETFs, if you look at the top 10 U.S. equity ETF inflows, quality, value, and dividend income was the common theme for the top 10 e ETFs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, DJ, just comment. I, I think uh, Nate made a very interesting point about tech funds having mm -hmm. outflows after getting it. We had big inflows for two years. I mean, really big inflows. And right. now we've had outflows for tech funds in the first quarter, even as Nate mentioned, Ka Kathy Wood's uh, ARC fund. Uh, so I'm, it's curious to me to see outflows when actually tech stocks have been out relative outperformers this year. Usually they go along. With, with the trend, right? But they're not this year. Yeah. And I, that, yeah. that's curious to me. There's, I think there's comfort in investing in companies that are making money now. So there's a term, short duration uh, equities, right? Companies that are making money, lower PE, price to earnings ratios. And that's really what we're seeing with the flows. And if you look at the funds, like Nate mentioned, uh, the growth funds, you know, really those are more a bet on the future on future cash flows years down the road. And by the way, when rates go up, you tend to discount those future cash flows. So there are some fundamental reasons why they might not be seeing the inflows. And then again, the human emotion of seeking certainty in an uncertain world in an uncertain time right now. Yeah, you know, it's curious to me, um, Nate, among ETFs, it's, it's not a high yield or corporate bond fund that, that seems to have the highest quarter to date outflows, ESG funds are seeing some very noticeable outflows. Um, iShares has a uh, ESG a fund, uh, ESGU, which has had nearly $6 billion in outflows. Uh, has ESG lost its luster? Is it due to politics or the, the underlying stocks are poor performers? What's going on here? 
I think it's a confluence of several factors. And we saw this trend start to develop last year where, uh, first of all, if you look at the performance of uh, ESG funds in general over the past year or two, they've underperformed the broader benchmarks. And investors are seeing that underperformance and, and, and questioning whether this is something that they want to allocate to in a portfolio. I think certainly ESG has become much more politicized over the past year. And I'll tell you, just from an advisor's perspective, we don't want politics in our portfolios. We always have to assume that 50% of our clients are on one side of the aisle, 50% on the other. And certainly there's a spectrum there. But ESG uh, has become viewed as much more politicized. And I, I don't think that's something that advisors uh, want to allocate to. And I think investors are questioning. And, and then the third point is simply that I think ESG as a whole is under a microscope where uh, and investors are wondering, you know, what does this really do? Does does me investing in an ESG approach have any meaningful uh, difference on society at large? Because that's one of the ways that ESG has been marketed. Now, certainly, we can have a conversation around whether or not screen for certain ESG factors can reduce the risk of, of a portfolio. I think there's a, a, a certainly a, a, a debate to be had there, but I think just stepping back and you look at the way ESG has been marketed as a whole, um, I, I think investors uh, aren't buying it. And we're seeing that in the flows. Yeah, I've had some intellectual differences with ESG funds for a long time, um, but they're intellectual differences. And remember, E, S, and G can be very different subjects. Um, so it's a really tough subject to sort of mash these three things together and create performance metrics around it. And then you throw in the fact that some of this has become very politicized uh, it makes it even more difficult. <laughs>